Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video and today is going to be a follow-on video to the one I did last week which was all about albums that sold lots of copies but did not become legendary. This video seems to have gained um, quite a lot of traction, it's had a lot of, a lot of views, a lot of comments which is great. Thank you very much to everybody who's tuned in and uh, some really interesting comments actually. So uh, one or two people saying maybe I'd done the video the wrong way around and I should have started by trying to define actually what is a legendary album in order to then talk about albums that are not legendary, which I think is a fair enough comment. So let's do this now and then you can just imagine that you watch this video first. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. So one other thing about that video is that lots of people or a few people anyway, step forward to challenge my assertion that two of the albums that I showed in that video were not legendary. So at the end of the video, I showed Brothers in Arms by Die Straits and I also showed Hysteria by Def Leppard and I questioned whether they were legendary on the same level as some of the other records I'd been showing. And uh, I must admit, in the back of my mind, I did wonder whether I'd got that right, whether I'd called that right, because, you know, those two albums are huge. And sure enough, quite a few people stepped forward, not so many for the Def Leppard, but quite a few stepped forward to defend Brothers in Arms and just said, look, you know, that album was so huge and so era-defining. How can you possibly say it's not legendary? <laughs> so fair enough. So I'm going to I'm going to show some records today. I'm going to show 30 records, vinyl records, plus one CD. And uh, I think all of them, uh, you can make a case for them being legendary. And I've included Hysteria and Brothers in Arms. And I've tried to, I've tried to file them according to the category of legendariness uh, that I think that they might fall into. I mentioned in the first video that this idea of being legendary... Uh, it means that you've got to have a broad consensus. You know, the vast majority of music listeners have got to come on board with the idea that, yes, that, that is a legendary album. Now, <clears throat> there are some albums which I think are legendary, but only to serious hardcore music fans or, you know, people who collect records. This being an example, this is What Colour Is Love by Terry Callier. And I remember buying this record on CD from Oxfam many years ago. It was a blind buy. I picked it up and I just thought that cover is totally legendary. And that is the word that went through my head. And when I listened to the music, I thought also this music is also legendary. <laughs> it's a definition of legendary, which just is only meaningful to people like us. You know, people who listen to records, buy records. There's a certain kind of sound, a certain kind of imagery, you know, deep soul music from the 1970s just the iconography of the black girl on the chair with a cigarette it just screams out you know cult legend um so but you know to the broader public maybe not quite so much i did mention this in the first video as well big star the first big star album i suppose is representative of a certain kind of cult album which you know we record collectors or serious music addicts know about and we sort of understand that it's legendary and influential but uh, maybe the vast majority of record buyers again might not know about that record and this is a, you know really obscure one this is one that I only learned about when I started to get involved in the vinyl community the Louvin brothers and uh, <laughs> Satan is real what an incredible cover that is um, you know I would say that screams out legendary legendary lost album but um how many sort of regular punters know about that one is a moot point and then this one i suppose is the big obvious one um you know this might be the most legendary sort of difficult album of all time captain beefheart and trap mass replica famously unlistenable um to some people um, but again, you know, just everything about it screams out legendary, doesn't it? But only in that very narrow sense. So those four, those first four records, I think, fall into a category of their own. They're sort of legendary, but not, not in the broader sense that we want to look at this. You know, legendary meaning there's this broad consensus. So what does legendary mean? We need to just quickly look at some definitions before we actually get into the bulk of the album. So I checked two sources. And the first source I checked was the Oxford Online English Dictionary. And they came up with two definitions. There was the first one was remarkable enough to become famous or very well known, which I thought was quite nice. So this idea of the album needs to be remarkable. It's not just enough that it sold squillions of copies. It has to be remarkable enough to become famous. I also checked um, AI as well. There's a sort of AI thing in Google where you can ask AI to come up with a definition. So I asked it, what is the definition of a legendary album? And it came up with this really interesting one. Albums that are associated with 
with well-known or notorious stories, myths and legends. And that really fired my imagination straight away, this idea of an album becoming legendary because of the stories that are told about it. Now I've got four, I think, four examples of this um, and we'll just quickly go through them. So this one sprang to mind immediately, The Best of Muddy Waters. This is one of two albums that Mick Jagger was carrying when Keith Richards met him at the train station in Dartford in 1961 or whenever it was. He had um, Chuck Berry rocking at the hops, which I suppose also qualifies, and then this one, The Best of Muddy Waters. I picked this up from Oxfam a few years ago, incredible album. But, um, you know, it's that kind of story, I think, which can really elevate an album. The thing about Muddy Waters is that he's already clearly legendary. I mean, he looks legendary on the cover, doesn't he? Hugely influential, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. But just, you know, I like the idea of there being a story, a story that is attached to the record, which looms large in rock legends. Um, of course, the problem with these stories is that not everybody knows them. And as time goes on, and, you know, younger people get into music and these stories maybe start to fade away, uh, you know, people streaming music nowadays don't necessarily know these stories, but I still think it's quite interesting. Um, Bob Dylan, the freewheeling Bob Dylan. I think there's lots of interesting stories attached to this record. The cover, for one, um, you know, dealing with his girlfriend in the snow. But also this record has the story attached to it that it was the first Dylan album, really, that the, um, that the Beatles got into heavily. And it was the album that uh, I think John and George particularly played non-stop. And they were absolutely taken by it and uh, it was not long before the Beatles met Bob for the first time so uh, I think that's quite interesting you know these the way that these albums form little sort of networks in rock history and they they serve to connect one person up with another which I suppose is a sort of integral elements of storytelling um, one that I've not that I'm not showing because I don't actually own it is, is Rumours by Fleetwood Mac obviously which is probably the greatest soap opera album of all time all the band members having uh, romantic liaisons and you know splitting up and getting back together again and having affairs and soap boxes full of cocaine in the studio that kind of thing um pink floyd wish you were here is quite a famous one the story of how sid barrett came to just turn up one day randomly at the studio while they were recording shannon you crazy diamond a song that was actually about him that story is one of just the most legendary stories, I think, in rock history. And the fact that he'd um, shaved his head and his eyebrows and he was just this strange loner character just turning up. And, you know, he'd been the band's leader originally. And just there's so much there. There's such depth to that story and such pathos to it that anybody listening to Wish You Were Here Now who's not aware of that story, I think, is is missing something. And staying on the subject of Sid Barrett, I think also his first solo album would qualify for that, just the story of how it got put together and the way that he was um, mentally crumbling in the studio, which you can hear on some tracks, actually. Uh, there's a very interesting story attached to this record and the one after. I think the story of Sid Barrett's downfall um, over the course of making those two records, I think makes both of them legendary. I think, you know, those particular myths and legends, you know, how many of them are true, how many of them are made up, um, there are just so many, and um, I think it's all part of the experience of listening to Sid Barrow, that you understand those stories and that you understand those uh, those myths or true stories that they may have been. So that's that category, albums filled with legends and stories. So we're eight records in. We're now going to move on to another category of legendary album, which is one that I just came up with myself. I've come up with a few categories, and so you know we'll go through... As I said, there's, there's 30 albums, we've done eight of them already, so stick with me. So this next one is albums that defined a musical genre. And I think any album that does that, any album that comes out, does something totally different, or not totally different, but does it um, synthesises elements of music that have not been put together in that way exactly. And there's maybe a sort of spark of originality, an original voice that comes through. And essentially, anybody who is going to try and make music in that genre after that has got to reckon with it. So, of course, we've got Bob Dylan inventing folk rock uh, with Highway 61. Absolutely legendary. Um, a bit later, you've got the sort of the turn of the the turn of the decade moving into the 1970s, the singer songwriters that came up. I think there's a couple of albums or a few albums or a few artists that seem to symbolise that move towards more of a kind of bedsit, um, inner world, introspective kind of world of singer songwriters, you know, folk influence. So we've got Nick Drake. Uh, I think all three of his albums are legendary. 
I think being dead helps too. I mean, if you make a great album and then die, I think that really helps your legendary status. But we've got Nick Drake and uh, we've got Joni Mitchell, of course, Blue. Most of her 1970s albums are brilliant, but this seems to be the one that um, laid down the template for that whole sort of L.A., Laurel Canyon kind of scene. You know, James Taylor and Jackson Brown and those kind of artists. Very... Very introverted, existentialist, um, autobiographical. And there's just something about the music on this album, the, just the piano backing and the way it's recorded. It just seems to define a whole way of making music and a whole way of writing songs. Uh, by complete contrast, let's just talk about soul for a minute. So Southern Soul, I could have picked a few for this. I went with um, Otis Blue, just seems to just absolutely define that, uh, that stacks sound you know with the memphis horns and it just has that wonderful kind of deep deep american deep south kind of sound to it tom dowd um engineering you know just a great um genre defining sound i would say you know and all the musicians on the record just you know truly superlative and then blue-eyed soul i thought i couldn't leave this one out i think if you wanted to explain to somebody what is blue-eyed soul you'd play them dusty in memphis and this one too actually could fall under the category of albums that have lots of stories attached to them because there's some quite interesting history and stories with this record about dusty and her insecurities while making this album but i think you know absolutely iconic and legendary Helps have a great cover as well. In fact, I'd be, I'd be surprised if any of these albums have bad covers. It's really hard to be legendary without an iconic um, album jacket design, I think. Bit of reggae. Um, with Bob Marley, you could have chosen. There's a few Bob Marley ones you could have chosen. I went with this one, the live album, because it has the uh, just that great version of No Woman, No Cry on side two, uh, which is just absolutely, you know... Genre defining, I suppose, as far as reggae is concerned. Speaking as a layman, you know, I'm not a huge expert in reggae, but, you know, to me, that absolutely sums up what reggae music is just the cover uh, of Bob with his dreads and just the vibe of the, just of the music and just the audience response and that very, that sort of spiritual fervor that you get on this record. I think is totally legendary. Uh, prog rock, of course, totally legendary. Uh, by Common Consent, the album that invented progressive rock. Is it the best King Crimson album? That's a video for another day. I don't think it is, uh, but certainly I wouldn't pull any other Crimson album while trying to make a video about legendary albums and albums that define genres, so certainly that one would have to count. Back to soul music again. I've sort of interrupted the soul ones, haven't I? Um, maybe I'm going chronologically. I could be. Um, Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? 1970. Um, the Birth of Political Soul, maybe. Um, you know, Curtis Mayfield ran with this. Stevie Wonder ran with it. And just a very important album, I think, in the development of soul music and certainly of Marvin's career. You know, it's the moment when he kind of seized control of his career, really. You know, Motown did not want him to make this record. They didn't want to put it out. It just ran counter to their whole ethos, really, that kind of party atmosphere that Motown Records always had. Marvin wanted to do something political, spiritual, and um, that album totally defined that genre, I think. Political soul music from the 1970s. Heavy Metal, you know which album I'm going to show. First Black Sabbath album, uh, which um, totally defined that kind of heavy, doomy kind of sound. Hugely influential totally legendary punk uh, i could have shown two albums for this i thought about showing the first clash album which i think was massively influential uh, but of course this is the big one this is the one that everybody bought back in the day and uh, you know it made such a huge difference and really defined what punk was even though it had quite a, a sophisticated production by chris thomas you could argue actually the clash the clash's first album maybe is is more proper punk it's got more of a lo-fi aesthetic this is kind of polished up punk but the attitude and John Lydon's vocal delivery and his lyrics and the Steve Jones guitar sound, I think, absolutely defined uh, that genre. Uh, and then we come to uh, <laughs> we come to Def Leppard. So I put Def Leppard into this category. Albums that defined a genre. Now, you might not agree with me. I'm not the biggest expert on 80s hair metal and that sort of pop, that pop metal that came up in the 1980s. But I'm going to say, yeah, let's say that... Def Leppard defined that, really, with the Mutt Lang production, the multi-layered vocals, and there was a certain kind of guitar sound, that sort of arpeggiated thing that they 
um, that they did in Def Leppard and just, you know, those songs, Pour Some Sugar On Me and Armageddon It, they seem to sum up an entire uh, movement really in the 80s, pre, pre Guns N' Roses, certainly pre Nirvana, that kind of MTV rock. I suppose you'd have to have, you could maybe have Bon Jovi in there as well. What was the big album Bon Jovi had? I don't know. Uh, but I'll put Def Leppard in there anyway. So there it is. It is in the list of legendary albums. So thanks to everybody that um, pulled me up on that one in the last video. Right, let's move on to... Right, albums that defined the zeitgeist. So there's a word. Never quite convinced that I'm saying it right. I should just say that all these categories kind of blend into each other, really. Zeitgeist albums. So you get albums which they come out at just the right time into a particular milieu, a particular kind of scene, and they just seem to just absolutely chime with what's going on. And in retrospect, um, well, they last for a start. So the, so the music on them is sufficiently great that it kind of transcends and then when people look back at the era, they go, yeah, that album or that music just absolutely seems to nail the atmosphere. You know, what was in the water at the time? And um, this first one, I think, definitely did that. Piper at the Gates of Dawn by Pink Floyd. The Spirits of 1967. Yeah, you could have Sgt. Pepper as well, of course. But Piper at the Gates of Dawn, I think, maybe had a more subversive edge to it. Had more of a kind of dark hallucinogenic thing going on the Sid Barrett songs those sort of fairy story songs like the gnome and the scarecrow uh, they just have 1967 written all over it you know flower power carnaby street I mean just look at the way that they look on the cover um, it's just yeah total 67 isn't it Floyd and then I've skipped ahead a little bit and um, back to 1970 again. We've already talked about 1970, 71 with a couple of albums, actually, in the previous categories. But I think Simon and Garfunkel, much like Joni Mitchell's Blue, summed up that turn of the decade sense of um, hangover, really. Post-1960s hangover, uh, you know, drug cases, people just realising that the dream, the dream is over, the dream is gone. And Simon and Garfunkel come along with this very sort of autumnal looking album, which uh, which has these very it's kind of sad, reflective, philosophical songs that people were going to be listening to in their bed sits, um, you know, while while skinning up joints on their turntable. It just absolutely screams out 1970, doesn't it? Um, and then back to Floyd again, actually, a couple of years later, I think quite quite similar in a way, Dark Side of the Moon encapsulated that sense of early 1970s malaise. I think it was, you know, I think Roger Waters has consciously worked with that. I think he he kind of realised what, he, he sort of realised what was going on in the counterculture at the time. People growing older, people growing more depressed, more anxious, getting sucked into the world of work, mental health, all kinds of things going on, a changing political scene. And uh, I think one of the reasons this album was so huge was that it, it just seemed to capture the prevailing um, mood of the nation, really, or mood of the world, even. So, Dark Side of the Moon. Um, the following decade, we'll put the Stone Roses in here. I think this album certainly seemed to sum up that um, second Summer of Love vibe um, at the end of the 1980s, the sort of acid house thing coming through, ecstasy, uh, Manchester, you know, baggy, baggy tops and tie-dyed gear. And uh, the shuffling drum sounds and just this sort of Birdsian kind of jangle, which did seem to sum up a whole genre of music at the time. Again, I could have put this one, albums that um, defined a genre, but we'll go with the Zeitgeist because I think it did. It was the pre the pre Nirvana kind of era, really, and uh, you know, for a brief period, everything was everything was lovely and happy. Um, and in fact, I've skipped. I should have put this one next. Well, I've, I've kind of saved it to last because, again, this is the one that I kind of dissed in the first video. But we'll put Brothers in Arms in here, Zeitgeist albums. Now, whether this is a good Zeitgeist thing or not, I don't know. But to me, this album does, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's famous for being the kind of, the soundtrack to the yuppie uh, mid-1980s era, isn't it? Was it 87? Sort of just over the middle of the decade and um the album crossed over so massively i think it was bought by lots of executives probably and uh estate agents and it just became the soundtrack for that kind of 1980s thatcher kind of world i suppose you know materialism and that kind of thing which of course it did send up you know the track money for nothing i'm not saying that martin Knopfler himself was a yuppie far from it um but the music on the album and the way it was produced just i don't know it just totally seems to embody 
that sort of era. I mean, for many people, it was the first CD that came into their house. It was just the first gleaming sounding, just, in, just really amazing sounding for its time. I think it's dated now, obviously it's dated. That was one of the reasons I, I, I sort of didn't want to put it in the list originally, was that my logic was that to be a legendary album, you've got to not sound dated, but I don't think that's exactly fair. And in fact, this next album will demonstrate that. So I've got two categories left and there's six records to go. So we're nearly there. Albums that changed music. I'm not going to spend too long on this because I think it's fairly self-explanatory. I've got three records to show. I'm going to go with the Beatles, Please Please Me from 1963, which um, doesn't always get the respect that it used to get. Um, I do tend to find this album tends to sort of languish at the bottom of people's lists when they come to talk about favourite Beatles albums. I can sort of see why, you know, it's the Merseyside sound, it's the Cavern sound. It was an album that was meant to be, the plan for it originally had been to record it live at the Cavern so again, it was a you know definitely a zeitgeist album, um, but um, it completely changed music overnight. Really, just that you know, just that idea of the four piece band coming in and you know the songwriters being part of the band, and it was just obviously you know just a huge turning point in British music and British culture. A bit later in the decades, we've got um, "Are You Experienced" by Hendrix, and I think Hendrix on the live circuit in London and with his first album, totally just, I think they blew everybody's minds, essentially. Everybody, you know, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton, all those guitar heroes, they were just, uh, they were totally bamboozled by Hendrix. And I think this first album um, was just a huge, massive um, firecracker going off, really, in the collective musical consciousness of the 1960s. You know, the Beatles loved it, everybody loved it, and uh, some really fiery playing from Mitch Mitchell, and uh, just an amazing, an amazing soundscape of, of wonder, really. So, had to have that one. Not had any jazz yet, and I apologise for doing the most obvious example possible, but let's put kind of blue in there, albums that change music, you know, the modal style of playing. Not the only album that was doing it at the time, but I think Miles Davis and his band on this record did it in such a way that it just, I think it made everybody realise who was a jazz musician that they could do jazz in a different way. It didn't have to be fast, it didn't have to be, you know, overly virtuosic, it could be... You could be, you know, much more meditative and peaceful and uh, just get into the groove and just play some wonderful laid back solos. And there's a reason why the album crossed over massively. It was because um, it was just incredibly accessible, I think. And um, you could maybe argue a case for it not being Miles' best album. I think um, I would go along with that, actually. But you certainly couldn't argue with it having, um, having changed the course of jazz music. And the final one we'll go with, this is <laughs> this last category is one that I'm a little bit unsure of. I thought I'd throw it in there and, uh, just to see what people think. So this, uh, these are albums which explicitly play around with the idea of myths and legends. So, um, you know, albums where the band or the artist is pretending to be somebody else or they're flirting with... Um, mythical imagery, storytelling, that kind of thing. This one, which could have come under quite a few of the other categories, I'll go with um, David Bowie and Ziggy. For this particular category, um, just, you know, weaving this idea of Bowie as the as the alien. And um, I think it does, it does confer a certain legendary quality onto the album with its iconic cover, obviously. I mean, Bowie was always so ahead of the curve. I mean, there were so many of his albums, which I think are legendary, uh, you know, for numerous reasons, because he was inventing new genres as he went, or he was maybe not inventing genres, but he was kind of owning genres. He was just exploding styles of music as he went and just colonising them and reinventing himself. But anyway, I, I mean, the you know, the Berlin albums, I think, are certainly legendary. Um, there's all kinds of stories attached to them. You know, you've got Bowie and Iggy, um, going off to Berlin and just getting wasted and starving themselves and just making all this strange music in the company of Brian Eno and Tony Visconti in some crumbling mansion in Berlin somewhere. I mean, it's all... I think, you know, Bowie, I think, ticks most of the categories on this list, really. But we'll have him there anyway, Myths and Legends. And this one, again, this is an album which could have fallen anywhere uh, in the categories, but Led Zeppelin IV with the very mysterious, enigmatic album cover, the strange guy with the sticks on his back and the... Um, just the deeply Tolkien-esque 
nature of the um, of the inner gate folds, and then you've got the the four symbols on the record label, obviously, you know, just overtly playing, I suppose, with that idea of myths and legends, and uh, I think that definitely helped to um, sell that album. It was very sort of uh, runic and uh, enigmatic. And the final one, to end on a sort of light note, I thought, why not? Let's put this one in. Let's put... Um, Let's put Tales from Topographic Oceans in. I think it is a legendary album. I think it's a flawed album, but I do think I do think it's a very significant record. And the fact that it was inspired by, I think it was a was it a footnote in the Bhagavad Gita or something like that. It was some some tiny bit of um, Hindu verse that um, John Anderson had read, and he, he spun it out into this huge double album with all this, you know, really virtuosic playing and. Um, it seemed to again. It seemed to define. It, it seemed to define a genre. But um, yes, we're quite good at playing around with all those kind of mythical, legendary tropes and imagery. I mean, just look at that cover. You know, it couldn't be more legendary, could it? Yeah, I, I, I did slightly wonder about including that category because I wouldn't like to say that you know any band or artist that flirts with mythical imagery. Uh, automatically has legendary status conferred on them. I'm not quite so sure about that, but you know what I mean. So there we go, that is my take on it. Oh, I forgot to show the CD. <laughs> now then, Kiss. Which category am I going to put this in? Probably go with um, an album that... Maybe an album that defined a genre, maybe? 1970s, American, arena rock. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's the Zeitgeist one. I don't know. Let me know. Take me to task on that one if you don't agree. Right, thank you very much for watching. If you've got through the video, I'm impressed and uh, I really enjoyed that. So thanks very much for the big response to the first instalment and uh, keep the comments coming and uh, I will see you in the next video. Take care. Bye for now.